All right, everybody, let's get started. Welcome. Um, so this is the Homecoming Writing Awards and English Faculty Flash Talks. If you're in the wrong place, you, you can't leave. You have to stay. Um, the good news, there's gonna, there is food, which I guess no one has any, so make sure you grab some on the way out. Um, so we've done both Homecoming Writing Awards and English Faculty Flash Talks a number of times, um, but only once before as a combined event. And it was really awesome last year when we did this, in part because it's rare that faculty and students share their work in one place together. So um, I'm excited to hear what everybody has to say. Um, we're not going to really say a lot more besides that. We have some people on Zoom um, joining us. Um, so uh, it's a hybrid event. Um, I think we should just get started because uh, we want to get to especially the student writing. Um, so we're going to start with the homecoming writing contest winners. and. Um, each student will, will do a, a sort of a brief reading. We have one video, I believe, in addition to the in-person readings. And then we'll move on to five uh, faculty flash talks from across our different areas on all sorts of interesting topics. There might be a sort of spooky theme to some of these talks. Um, that's what I've been promised, at least. Um, so we'll see if everybody lives up to the sort of Halloween billing. Um, the students, you know, there's not going to be a strict time limit, but there's going to be a strict five-minute five, five minute time limit for faculty, um, which I guess I'm enforcing. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I had this really good clock that, you know, I used to time my toddlers, um, and I was going to use that, but they stole it. I can't find it. <laughs> so I guess maybe talk for as long as you want. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, Without further ado, so we're going to start with poetry, um, and the winner for poetry is Katerina Marchetta, um, who's going. Uh, I'll introduce briefly. Um, an Arizona native, uh, uh, Katerina is pursuing a BA in English with a concentration in creative writing and a minor in Slavic studies. Uh, she's a staff writer at College Magazine, a student-led online online magazine for college students, and uh, the the title of uh, the the collection of uh, six poems is Love Curses and grief. So I'll hand it over to Katerina. Hi, my name is Katerina Marcheta, and this is a reading of The Curse of Cassandra, one of my poems in Love, Curses, and Grief, a collection of six poems. So here we go. She is full of pain and rage and grief. She wonders how many she could have saved if she had only let him touch her, if she hadn't refused the hand of the bright one, her maker and destroyer. Please listen. She wishes she didn't know or see the perished walls of an invincible city, fallen warriors, a boy murdered for treasure, her mother's desolate eyes, a golden veil torn away, a newborn destined to bring the destruction of everything for the love of a woman. Please listen. His most beautiful daughter, they whisper. Shame, isn't it, that she isn't quite right in the head, the murmur sound. No one knows how or why she went mad. Instead, they turn to stare and shake their heads in pity. Please listen. She thinks of darling Hector, of the shining helmet, and weeps for her brother, for his wife and infant son, who will meet the same fate, and thinks she could have saved them all, if only she had a voice. Please listen. Wild eyes, armed with, armed with a torch and an axe, she lunges at the giant horse, but arms grab her, thrashing and wailing, they drag her away shaking their heads, whispering of the king's deranged daughter. Please, listen. She lays at her father's feet, begging, pleading, weeping. But he smiles sadly, reaches out, and strokes her dark hair with his old withered hand. She tries to ignore the sight of his body, the spear running through it at the foot of the altar. Please, listen. Ragged breaths rack her body. Her fingers find her temple, and she is once again befuddled, staggering, faint, falling Senna, standing, defiant, at the grave of the man who cut down their brother, and then she too falls at the feet of the vengeful son. Please listen. Later, as his hands burn her skin and she ceases to spurn his advances, as she tears her robes now turned into rags, desecrating, defiling, dishonoring, she catches Athena's eye and doesn't seek to pray, because she knows how this will end. She has seen it countless times, and she tries not to think of what is to come. Please listen. She is full of pain and rage and grief as she stands behind her new master. She thinks of the golden-haired god and wonders if she could ever forgive him 
if she could have asked for death, because even that would have been better than silence and disregard. She smiles as the ship nears, as the unforgiving mother awaits, two sisters bringing the end of all she once knew, and sighs with a smile, knowing. Thank you. Okay, so next we're going to be um, hearing from our scholarly essay award winner, Wilson Ampriester. Is that pronounced right? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, good. And what, uh, so Wilson is a senior at ASU and will graduate in the spring with a bachelor's degree in film and media studies. Outside of class, he spends his time as a writer and performer for ASU's historic Far Side Sketch Comedy Hour, host of Stand Up vs. the World, and the director of Bear in Mind Improv. Um, and the title of Wilson's uh, scholarly essay is Body Horror and Change and David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future. All right. Uh, I don't, do I need to read directly from it? Because I, I, ass I assume that most people haven't seen the movie. I don't know if it's very interesting to... You've seen it. <laughs> One person. Uh, you can just talk to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I assume it might not be like super, super interesting to listen to because I wrote it kind of with the presumption that, you know, the reader has seen it. I think if you read it, you can kind of get the point, but hearing it out loud, it's kind of just a lot of words. And also it probably sounds really alarming because the movie is about like people performing surgery on themselves and becoming aroused by that sexually. And... A lot of really cool stuff, but if you heard it, you might be like, what is wrong with Wilson? <laughs> uh, so instead, I'm just going to kind of describe, explain a little bit about what the movie's about, and then maybe read from a little bit further into the paper. Um, the movie, Crimes of the Future, is like a lot of Cronenberg movies. It's dealing with like body horror as a way of evoking uh, like ideas about change and the fear of not having control over your own body kind of in an ever-changing world. And it's like super timely because it takes place in this near-apocalyptic near future in which humans are evolving to have new organs so that we can consume like plastic. Um, and in the film, uh, people with these new organs can no longer consume normal food, and people with the old organs can't consume like the new food, this new plastic, and there is a lot of fear. It's like super scary in the movie. People no longer feel pain, um, but it's not like a normal horror. It's not really about like being afraid. It's more just uncomfortable. Um, and so I argue in my paper that the uh, film is primarily about reactions to this type of change and this um, lack of control. And narratively, that's apparent uh, because politically there is all this. Uh, the government is trying to force everyone to cut the new organs out of their body and refuses to let their body change. And it's about bodily autonomy. And there's a little bit of um, like a queer allegory in there and ideas just about, oh, do you have control over your own body? And can you let it change naturally? Um, there's also uh, like kind of an artistic element where as the people develop new organs, they become performance artists and there's kind of a, uh, it spurs them to try to get attention um, using their new organs and some of the art is like hacky and some of it is semi-beautiful or arousing and from that develops this idea that the surgery is the new sex because it is a way of finally, it's almost that they are aroused by the fact that they can finally take control of their changing bodies and their uncontrollable bodies. Um, that's all besides the point. There's a larger argument within the paper, but I don't think, it's a very dense movie, and I just don't think reading the whole thing would be worthwhile. Uh, the main thing that uh, I'm so impressed with, because it's the thing I like in movies at large, is when they can make you feel things that you don't want to feel. Um, so movies that can like make you uh, s smile when you should be sad or make you like really uh, happy and excited when you should be horrified. So make, they make violence fun, they make stuff that's like perverted and weird, um, like romantic, and then here they make stuff that is really gross, uh, they make it sexy. Um, and so my argument is that in Crimes of the Future, Cronenberg uses uh, certain aspects of Linda Williams's body genres in order to uh, alter the audience's like reaction to certain images to both evoke feelings of 
like squirmishness and horror, and then also emotions of arousal in order to communicate this larger message that's also housed within the narrative of the film. Um, so I'm going to read from here. Um, Crimes of the Future's manipulation of body horror to evoke impulses of pain and pleasure can be better understood through the lens of body genres. In her article, Film Bodies, Gender, Genre, and Excess, Linda Williams identifies body genres, horror, pornography, and melodrama, as films concerned with the spectacle of a body caught in the grip of intense sensation or emotion, and which produce a similar sensation within the viewer through depictions of ecstatic excesses visual or oral signals of a body beside itself with sexual pleasure, fear and terror, or overpowering sadness. Vitally, Williams identifies that the marker of significance in body genres is that the body of the spectator is caught up in almost involuntary mimicry of the emotion or sensation of the body on the screen. The audience observes and is affected by the sensation associated with both the intense experience and the intense reaction of the subject. Cronenberg's use of body horror in Crimes of the Future roughly follows this model. However, rather than portray moments of extreme fear with the goal of eliciting screams or extreme sadness with the goal of eliciting tears or direct like arousal and penetration and pornography, all that, um, he instead focuses on moments of bodily mutilation, gore, or unnatural behavior and anatomical change, resulting in squirms, gross outs, and general sympathetic discomfort from the audience. This can be seen in Crimes of the Future in many scenes, including when there's a character, Brecken, who at the beginning is eating this plastic trash bin at the beginning of the film because he's developed new organs and has to eat plastic, and the audience's discomfort is amplified by the sound design, which focuses on the ear, uh, the ear on the action. So it's this gross, crunching sound as he's biting into this plastic trash bin, and it's really disturbing. There are scenes where uh, there's surgery and where um, the characters are struggling to eat and there's a gagging and they're stabbing into each other and it's really, it's the camera is almost exclusively focused on the actual action and it's really disturbing because it, you know, you don't want to see that. It's gross. Um, and uh, in each of these scenes, which I describe in the paper, but you know, not in, anyway. Uh, an, an excessively uncomfortable, gross, and seemingly painful experience is depicted with visual and oral cues to project this sensation onto the audience. Uh, uh, the audience is cued to the effective sensation of pain by their own immediate impulse given the depicted action. By altering and emphasizing characters' reactions to a body horror experience, Cronenberg effectively complicates the effect on the audience as well as the overall thematic implications of the body horror. In other scenes, so there are those ones where it is gross and uncomfortable and we feel a sense of, we feel the same fear and pain that they do as they undergo these horrifying changes. Um, there are other scenes in which as they are cutting into each other, the camera at first shows them cutting into each other and then lingers on their faces and on their sensation of arousal. So there are scenes in which they engage in new sex by using like a, a technological autopsy bed to slice into themselves, or there's one in which um, the main character, Saul Tenser, played by Viggo Mortensen, he uh, gets like installed on himself a zipper into his abdomen, and uh, his performance partner unzips it and then performs oral sex onto the ab abdominal zipper. Um, and throughout these different scenes, um, the otherwise disturbing images of gore and bodily harm are contrasted with reactions of pleasure and ecstasy from the characters experiencing them. By contradicting the generally negative sensational connotation of the spectacle, or the, the pain via the actual images of body horror, with a pleasurable sensation indicated by the reaction, Cronenberg effectively complicates the ecstatic emotion felt by the audience, uh, as well as the textual themes, uh, into one of simultaneously simultaneous eroticism and disturbance. Um, and I argue that these two things kind of morph into this larger, almost indescribable kind of just, it's the feeling. It's the feeling that the film evokes, where narratively you have all these ideas of, oh, these characters are pushing against the change and pushing against the, like, the, the way our bodies are morphing and these characters are really accepting of it. And then finally at the end of the film, our main character accepts it and he develops like a new ecstasy and all that. Um, and it, it has relations to the sublime of uh, as our body changes in this like way that is so insurmountable and we cannot comprehend it is both beautiful and horrifying and that's all in the narrative but within the actual feeling of the film and what the camera shows us and what the sound evokes it um, creates a new feeling um, 
that's a little bit more complicated where you can feel both at once. It's not just these characters feel this way and these characters feel this way. It's a, it's a feeling you almost don't want to feel, a feeling you don't want to imagine, and it's housed all within this near apocalyptic thing that I just think makes it really, really timely. Um, anyway, no, I didn't really read all of the paper, and I don't know if that's productive, but I just, I don't know, I figured, didn't think it would be that interesting to just have me read scholarly essay that about a film no one's seen. So, um, yeah, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Okay, we'll pause the program now and stream the whole Crimes of the Future film. Um, so, um, grab some food. Um, no, this sounds really fascinating. I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, okay, uh, so our final student award winner um, for fiction and creative nonfiction is Ava Ashtiani, um, who uh, is in her third year studying English, creative writing, and is set to graduate in the spring. She's involved in Pi Beta Phi sorority and has uh, served on the leadership and nominating committee, and she's also worked as an assistant editor for Hayden's Ferry Review. I just add one note, Ava says I can share the news. She just got into med school on Monday. Um, Ava was one of my great students um, last year, so just was excited to hear that news. Um, so we're gonna hear now um, a piece called Shereen's funeral cookbook. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read the first page. My family masks the stench of grief with sugar and honey. The quiet voices of my mom and grandma speaking Farsi are enough to send me over to the kitchen to eavesdrop, but they never say anything interesting. It's always about whether there is enough food. I don't know why they always worry about this. There's enough food for my entire second grade class to have seconds. In our small kitchen, Maman and both of my grandmothers crowd the space, all eager to do their part. My mom calls it healing, but I don't really know what she means by that. I watch in a corner where I'm out of the way, but still surrounded by the commotion, my heart pacing in my chest as the anticipation for the day settles in. Sugar, flour, butter, saffron, rose water, and raisins cover the countertops as the woman mix and pour and sprinkle. My mother's mom, Maman Perry, grabs chunks of homemade cookie dough, shaping them in her wrinkled hands before placing them on a tin. When she slides it over, signaling they can be baked, my other grandmother re-rolls them before placing the tray in the oven. Maman Patty either doesn't notice or doesn't have the energy to fight. I know this day is really serious because my grandmothers only tolerate each other this well when someone has died. Maman draws with cinnamon over the yellow rice pudding called Cholazard. The dessert smells so strong I can feel my mouth water. I take a deep breath. If I stay here another minute, I made all of it before the guests arrive, but I can't bring myself to leave. When the desserts are finally done, they get topped with crust pistachios and slivered almonds. My sister, she's younger than me, so I don't think she understands that death is bad, takes too much of every sweet thing. I whisper, Nakon, or don't do that, as the house begins to fill with people whose faces I only remember a little bit. I don't want them to see her greedy fingers while death lingers on the welcome mat. Thank you. All right. Um, can we just do one more round of applause for all the students? That was awesome. Um, and you, you'd save your heckling for the faculty now. Um, this is the fun, uh, fun part where we get to see all of us try to sort of sum up what we're doing um, in five minutes or less um, in a way that everybody in the room hopefully can follow and understand. Um, and I've done these a few times in the past. They're challenging. They're a lot of fun. And I'm excited to learn a little bit more about some of my colleagues' work um, right now. So we've got, it sounds like um, we're going to go in alphabetical order. And we're going to start with Melissa Free, who's joining us on Zoom. Um, and the title is Psychic Invasion. Um, uh, Melissa, I think you're going to have to be responsible for keeping your own time since you're you know, on the other side of the screen. But we trust you. Um, so I'll hand it over to Melissa now. Well, hello, everybody. I really enjoyed those presentations, and I will keep this to under five minutes. Um, I tried to follow the spooky theme, and so I've titled this Psychic Invasion. Um, building on examinations of hypnosis, clairvoyance, telepathy, and transposition of the senses in popular and scientific discourse and scholarly analyses of those, I'm looking at psychic influence as a technology of empire in 19, late 19th and early 20th century British literature. 
a period marked by the scramble for Africa, to Anglo Boer Wars. Um, and I always tell my students there were two, not just one, but the British lost the first, so they don't talk about it. Um, the death of Queen Victoria, World War I, and the expansion of the vote to agricultural laborers and women over 30. Um, so I mean specifically psychic uh, influence. Um, the uh, instances in which someone is compelled or enabled to behave in ways they normally would not as a result or could not as a result of outside influence. So that influence might be intentional hypnosis by a living human being, um, as in George uh, Du Maurier's Trilby, 1894, or H. Ryder Haggard's Benita, An African Romance, 1906. It might be the pull of the dead, as in John Buchan's 1910 short story set in uh, South Africa, The Grove of Ashtaroth, or again, in Benita. It might be the intentional exertion of a monstrous hybrid, uh, as in Bram Stoker's Dracula, 1897, or Richard Marsh's The Beetle, also 1897, or of an immortal being like Haggard's She, also 1897. Big, big year for monstrosity. It could be opium, unknowingly consumed, as in Wilkie Collins's The Moonstone, 1868, or the sins of the parents visited upon the child, as in Florence Marriott's The Blood of the Vampire, also 1897. So in each of the above texts and others I have not named, psychic ability or influence comes from or is enabled by contact with people and spaces outside of or on the edges of the metropole. So in the margins which within the metropole or Britain proper or colonial spaces or nearby. Looking in particular at the Jew, the Far East and people from the Far East, the Near East and the West Indies vis-a-vis -vis psychic influence, I hope to trace patterns of British attribution of particular characteristics to such people and places. In addition to exploring who and what employs this kind of psychic influence, I'm interested in over whom it is employed, toward what ends, and with what outcomes. Most of the time, psychic influence is depicted as a threat to the middle-class Britain, emanating from the colonial, the foreign, or the marginalized within the British social body. In these cases, psychological control is overtly linked to ideological control. Occasionally, however, external influences empower the Britain to manifest abilities that support the imperial project. In those instances, mind control is linked to a kind of cosmic justice. I don't have a good sort of end, uh, end sentence for you. I'm still very much in the process of doing this work. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. That was fascinating. Um, so I definitely didn't need the timer. So thank you very much for um, doing that so efficiently. Um, so uh, next, we'll move back in person with uh, Jacob Green, who's going to um, has, has a title of What is a Conversation? So I can't wait to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. All right, as you can see, I've been uh, deep in a book project. So the scariest part of this talk is that, you know, I may have stopped learning how to socially interact with people. So <laughs> it's a genuine question. Uh, no, it's kind of a teaser. Um, so I do want to talk about conversation, uh, why I think it's such uh, an important genre uh, in the time that we're in right now. Um, and I'll kind of just leave it at that. Um, but first, I want to get to uh, some key ingredients of really what makes a good conversation. Uh, so the essential elements of a great conversation, if you've been in one, um, I tried to distill this down. <laughs> Last night, I was making these slides. Um, for me, uh, no more than four people. Uh, more than that, it's just uh, too many people. I'm worried not everybody's participating. Um, 
it feels like turn taking. Uh, ideally, two or three, I feel like, is what makes a really good conversation. Great conversation is not an interview. Uh, we've all been in those kind of conversations where you feel like you're trying to just get information from somebody, or someone's trying to get information from you. They're not participating. A little bit too one-sided. Um, so along that same vein, uh, equal participation uh, among speakers usually is a good, good conversation. Everyone is uh, participating, um, is engaged maybe in some way. Um, and usually entertaining, uh, I think, is one of the, the first most important things of a good conversation. It needs to be entertaining. It doesn't necessarily have to be informative, but I think a great conversation is entertaining and informative in some way. You enjoyed it, and you probably learned something. Um, and then finally, it's usually organic. Um, but usually thoughtfully guided in new directions. If you've been with somebody who's really engaging kind of person, um, and you're like, I wonder what, what made it so easy, conversation flowed to different topics pretty well. So why am I talking about conversation so much? And you'll see when we have lunch, you know, why is this the guy talking about conversation? So I'm kind of awkward. Um, but I think the reason uh, is I think the conversation has become one of the dominant genres of podcasting. Um, and if you're familiar with any of these podcasts or probably some other podcasts, um, every day people are, you know, thousands of times a day downloading conversations to listen to. Um, that's not the only genre of podcasting is the, you know, conversation-based podcast. They're called chat casts, discussion-based podcasts. But it's probably one of the most dominant genres of podcasting. And right now I'm teaching a class called Writing for Podcasts. And I'll tell you, when most students come to the class, their idea of what a podcast is, is typically two to four people sitting in front of microphones talking about something, having a conversation, um, usually for anywhere from 30 minutes to about an hour and a half, two hours long. These are some of my favorite uh, conversation-based podcasts. Conversations with People Who Hate Me, really fantastic concept for a podcast from Dylan Marin, where he literally called, he was a content creator, and he calls people who were trolls on his social media accounts, and just has a conversation with them. And it's not an interview, he just chats with them, um, and it's so awkward, he picks up the phone, they say hello, and he says, hi, hi, they have this pleasantry, and he says, so, uh, last month, you know, you called me a blah, 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 on my Instagram account, you wanna tell me about that? Um, and it's really fast that you're hooked, you know, right from the start. Same thing with all of these. Really have all those ingredients of what makes a good conversation. And part of it is what researchers in, in podcasting or audio media call a parasocial uh, interaction, which we might think of as just simply conversations that are compelling enough that audiences not only want to listen in, but actually feel like they're a part of the conversation, come to develop some sort of social connection with the hosts. So building from this, I'm, I'm teaching this podcasting course. I've been thinking about you know, how students can engage with different genres of writing. Um, and I decided to use you know, that, that element of podcasting as one of the units in the podcasting course. We haven't gotten into it yet this semester when I'm teaching the class. I have taught it before. But essentially, um, it asks students to think about this skill of conversation, not just as something that you do in a social setting, but something that is delivered as you know, a rhetorical object that people will consume, that audiences will listen to, try to develop some of those parasocial um, interactions. And the last time I taught the class, um, I'll say it was a kind of a mixed bag because it's kind of new uh, thing for a lot of people to do, especially in a writing course. Um, but I think if we're thinking about how writers are engaging in new genres, learning how to hold good conversations, participate in, in great conversations as a uh, informed, entertaining, and engaged speaker is a, is a really vital skill. So this is the spooky part of my presentation. Um, obviously, a lot of talk about AI. Um, might be making some old genres dead. I don't think the essay is dead. Um, but I do think AI forces us to kind of rethink what kind of things students are learning in our classes, how they're engaging with different emerging genres. And I think the conversational podcast could be one of those. And that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, perfect. Well, self-timed also, really hopeful. Um, now we're going to have Kathleen Hicks who even worked spooky into the title, so we know we're in for a treat. Spooky success, conjuring a business writing class with chat GPT. Seamless transition. <laughs> Nothing spooky after that movie, though, so I don't know. <laughs> All right. OK, so I'm here to talk about what I think is a very spooky subject, artificial intelligence. And specifically, I'm going to describe the work that I'm doing developing a seven and a half week business writing online class using chat GPT. 
So I know a lot of people have scary feelings related to generative AI, especially in writing courses. So I'm hoping that what I'll tell you make you feel a little bit better. So quick note, oh, my title's gone, but uh, ChatGPT actually helped me generate my title, Spooky Success, Conjuring a Business Writing Class with ChatGPT. All I can say is that my experience has been like conjuring. I've been able to produce significant amounts of usable course content like magic, and it's actually been both eerie and exhilarating. So. So I was asked to integrate generative AI into English 302 in some way as part of a pilot. And I thought I'd be ambitious and see how I could design an entire course. Because one thing I'm really interested in is learning how um, generative AI can improve course development practices. So go big or go home, right? Um, so this is a kind of a two-fold experiment for me. How can we use AI to develop more effective and engaging courses? And how can generative AI be used to improve writing and writing instruction? So I'm just going to give you a brief summary of where I'm at so far, because I've really just gotten into the weeds of development. So I want to say I'm using ChatGPT in every aspect of the development process. So I'm into backwards design. So I started by asking ChatGPT, what kind of writing should students produce in a business writing course that integrates generative AI? It produced an excellent list of options. Some I was already considering. I went good sign so far. Um, that being an executive summary and a pitch deck design. Um, those are just two examples. But surprisingly, and I didn't ask it to do this, it also included really helpful suggestions for how students could be asked to use generative AI for each of the options. Uh, so with that foundation, I then asked it to produce an outline for a seven module course that integrates foundational business writing knowledge with principles and practices for using generative AI in business writing. It did so in about 20 seconds. The outline still needs a little tweaking, but it's an excellent foundation that effectively weaves these two threads together. So I've moved on to asking it to produce topic introductions, learning objectives, and all sorts of content and examples. So I'm going to dive into one specific example of content I have produced, a business proposal, which will center the course for students. So a problem I've had with the business proposal in the past is that it requires students to work with a lot of hypotheticals, which ultimately weakens their writing. So instead, I want students to work with an existing business proposal as a foundation so they can focus on very specific parts to hone very particular skills. So using ChatGPT, I have produced three proposals for students to choose from. Green Tech Urban Farming Solutions, EcoVogue, which combats issues with fast fashion, and Sonic Wave, a new music streaming service that focuses on amplifying local talent. So it took some repeated prompting to get ChatGPT to, produ to produce like sufficient detail in the sections of the proposal, but I was basically able to create three full-blown scenarios in about an hour, something I never would have been able to do. So students will be asked to choose one of these scenarios, and all of the writing they will produce throughout the course will be related to it. So for the proposal, students will undertake the following tasks. Use generative AI, and in this case it will be WordTune, to write the executive summary and market analysis sections of the proposal. They'll be asked to fact check and correct, if necessary, the AI-generated data throughout the proposal as an exercise in understanding the AI's limitations. They will generate the appendices, which will include links to accompanying related research so they show their understanding of the right types of persuasive data. They'll be asked to revise the entire proposal as necessary to shape it with a singular voice. And finally, they'll apply principles of document design, like the proposal template as it's created now is just a stripped down Word document. So this will allow them to demonstrate their understanding of visual design and business writing. The other writing they will produce in the course will include an accompanying AI-generated pitch deck for this proposal, a variety of social communications surrounding the company, um, and a, a series of internal and external messages to demonstrate their understanding of positive and negative messaging. 
They'll also be asked to reflect on their experience so I can learn about, um, you know, how AI impacted their composing processes. So more to come on that as all this stuff still under development. So I'll end by saying that a very important part of this process so far has been that I'm learning how to compose with generative AI, and I think that'll be invaluable experience I can share with my students. So I look forward to being able to report back on how this all turns out in another venue. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, and now we're going to move on to a different kind of experimental writing, I believe, right? Um, so we're going to have Jonathan Hope, who is uh, giving a talk um, from Flatland to Ravitska, Dimensionality in Experimental Writing. OK. So originally, when I put this together, I didn't think it was spooky. But today, I realized it is. But it's kind of psychological horror and existential horror rather than body horror. Um, I'm currently on on research leave, so of course I've got big projects that I'm working on, but of course it's much more exciting to think about possible new projects. So this is something completely different that I'm not actually working on yet, although it fits into things I've been interested in for a long time. And it ties into various things that happened in the department. So um, just very recently, the 2023 Fletcher lecturer, John Plotz, uh, led a reading group in the department on Edwin Abbott's 1884. This is Edwin Abbott on the on the left. 1884 satire set in a two-dimension flat called Flatland, set in a two-dimensional world populated by squares and polygons and triangles. Um, and as I was kind of participating in a in a in a reading group he led, I realized that there were links to the work of Rene Gladman, who in 2021 was the Begley Wright lecturer in the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands. And her work, and her, her, I'll talk about her four novels that she's written, the linked novels, which focus on the shifting architecture of a puzzling city called Ravika. Uh, next slide. So this is the title of the title page of Edwin Abbott's uh, Flatland. Um, it's a kind of, it's very curious work. This is, a, this is a recent edition of it, which is a fully annotated edition, edited by two mathematicians and published by the Mathematical Society of America and Cambridge University Press. And mathemat mathematicians and theoretical physicists love Flatland because it, um, they use it, and it's very often set on in undergraduate and graduate classes, because it's an ex apparently it's an excellent way of introducing uh, physicists and mathemat mathematics students to the notions of uh, higher orders of dimensionality. Uh, a lot of mathematics today, a lot of statistical analysis, uh, involves projecting data into dimensions, numbers of dimensions much higher than the three dimensions we experience hundreds, thousands of different dimensions. A lot of theoretical physics, physics uh, re relies on the, the imagination the, um, or, or the positing that actually there are more dimensions than the ones we experience and that in order to account for certain uh, effects in, rel in relativity and the way the particles uh, behave, we have to, some physicists have posited the possibility that there are kind of lots of extra dimensions kind of folded in to uh, the, 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 the world that we experience, and we, we, we can't experience them because of that. So it's, it's a kind of very curious novel, but it's had a very long life. Um, it involves, uh, it's narrated by a square, uh, a literal square, and it involves someone from the th our three-dimensional world coming into the two-dimensional world of Flatland. Um, and there's a lot of kind of discussion of various philosophical things. Move on to the next slide. We're going to zoom up, zoom in on this. This is this is the house that the square lives in. Uh, you can see it's a kind of pentagon, and you can see that his children um, are in every every generation of males in this in this world get extra sides. And that's, that, that moves you up through the social hierarchies. It's actually a social satire. And one of the ways in which you can see it's a social satire is here's his wife, who is a line. Uh, and there's, there's actually quite a lot of quite interesting kind of gender uh, satire. And because it means, and actually, there's a long discussion of um, they have to have sex very carefully. <laughs> And it's a kind of weird inversion. I guess it's kind of Cronenbergian inversion of the, 
the female is aligned and is able to puncture the square quite easily if they if they get it wrong. Um, <clears throat> so and that's that's kind of flatland. One of the things that flatland does is tries to pro, tries to model the process of moving imaginatively in spaces that are beyond your imagination. So it's very, very hard for the square to imagine what it's like to be in a three-dimensional world. And then at one point, he was talking to the, 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 the person from a three-dimensional world. At one point, he says to the person, well, what about a four-dimensional world? And the, the person says, that's impossible. So the, it kind of really enacts a kind of failure of imagination. Uh, okay, could we move on to slide? I want to, th I want to think about uh, Rene Gladman's work in relation to Abbott. And Gladman's work focuses on space, language, and consciousness. And her best known writing, as I said, is four novels about the imagined city of Ravika, which she wrote between 2010 and 2017. But since then, she's actually started working as a visual artist. Um, but you can see, and this is this is one of her this is one of her drawings. But you can see that she she draws with writing. So and she makes she makes architectural drawings of, of things that look like buildings and cities, in using a line that looks like script, although it's not actually you can't actually read it. You can you can look at it. Um, and let's. Move on to the next slide, which is the first paragraph. This is the first paragraph of the first Ravika novel. From the sky, there was no sign of Ravika, announces the narrator of the novel. And each one of the four novels has a different narrator, who is a completely different character, type of character. And in each of the novels, Ravika, the city, seems to be a kind of different, a different city. From the sky, there was no sign of Ravika. Yet I arrived. I met many people. Ravika, is it even on Earth? Has buildings, streets, neighborhoods, but they're liable to shift and disappear within and between the novels. Maps of Ravika are like poems about fluid space, which, they, which themselves change between consultations. Newcomers and native Ravikians alike find moving through the city unfamiliar and dreamlike. And to read these novels is to experience a heightened sense of the strangeness of urban spaces and architecture and by implication modernity. But the strangeness of the spaces of the Ravikian novels is not simply threatening or postmodernly playful. Rather, I think we feel a, a radical shift in consciousness of place the character's place in Ravika, our place in relation to the text. And the, nation of the, the, no, the nature of this is very hard to describe because it's achieved through a consistency and a lightness of tone, which is technically masterful, I think, and highly original. I think you can see from, from these, the way these sentences fix together, the tone is very light. It's, they're not complex sentences, but they're doing something weird to your psyche. Um, now, Gladman's narrators in these texts are not unreliable. I mean, an awful lot of experimental writing uses unreliable narrators to say things about that, about how we experience the world. Um, but her narrators are not unreliable, but the spaces they move through are. And her Ravikian sentences, as you can see, don't make use of disrupted syntax, which is another very frequent feature of experimental writing. But the meanings that they try to make are fleeting, and the completion of the sentences tends to make evident new gaps in the reader's understanding. And a very consistent theme of the books is the difficulty of knowledge and consciousness. And again, that's not uncommon in experimental writing from the early 20th century onwards. But what is different in Gladman's work is that the difficulties of knowing are not usually due to the frailty of human cognition or sense perception. Rather, they stem from a fundamental strangeness in the universe itself. Instead of focus, focusing on the self, which in most experimental writing, especially the early first half of the 20th century does, Gladman's work looks outward, and the imagined city of Ravika and the language that its people speak, which is only ever described, it's never transcribed, there's no, there's no examples of Ravikian in any of the novels. They allow the reader to reflect on the strangeness of our own spaces and our own language. Thank you.
Thank you, Jonathan. And now we'll um, have our final speaker come up, uh, Peter Torres, who's going to talk about linguistic representation of pain and racial disparities in chronic pain treatment. So I'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, when I was told that uh, share a scary research, I was like, oh, pains are scary, right? So I think that's timely. But yeah, I have this really long title because I figured uh, I'll just, if I go over five minutes, then at least you have the gist of what my study is about from the title. But yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. So unlike bruises or cuts, the symptoms of chronic pain are not always visible, right? So which is why patients mostly, physicians mostly rely on patients' verbal manifestation of pain when they are prescribing opiates. And I'm a linguist who studies opiates, and I'm going to try to make sense of that right now. Yeah, so... My, I have an, I'm conducting an ongoing research about a disparity um, caused by physicians' unfamiliarity with various linguistic practices that are heavily dependent on culture, such as being polite or asking for help, expressing vulner vulnerability, and so on. Um, this usually leads physicians uh, to misrepresent or misunderstand the pain of persons of color as uh, a drug-seeking behavior, which in a way produces barriers to healthcare. And as a result, the notion that the opioid epidemic is mostly hurting white people and is being overcome by people of color persists. Um, I hope a lot of you have been aware of that narrative that's been going around. So considering that there are cultural differences in the expression and perception of pain, this preliminary research that I'm working on seeks to examine whether there are correlations between patient's race, the, the race of a patient and the physician's opioid prescribing practices. Um, so this is just an oversimplification of what I'm doing right now, but I'll be happy to talk about it outside of uh, you know, the confines of a flash talk. Right? But bottom line is that this process involves uh, a discourse analysis, particularly uh, inductive coding of 171 interactions ranging from 20, 2006 to 2010. And I'm very lucky to have had the help of former undergrads who wanted to learn more about discourse analysis, so they helped me decode these conversations. Um, I'm, I, this data is actually gathered by Verilog. Uh, and I got access for, for, to this data from their racial equity grant. And so th this is not data that I gathered myself, uh, but I'm working but pretty much I'm working within the parameters of data that's already been gathered <laughs> for me. And uh, yeah, um, in this study, patients self-identified in terms of race. They were asked whether they self-identify as white or person of color. And I think the reason for that is because of the overwhelming disparity between the availability of data. Uh, there are way more um, white identifying patients who were willing to be recorded in comparison to persons of color. Uh, but since this is a preliminary study, what I'm working on right now is trying to disambiguate what person of color means and to specify the specific um, community, communities of practice that are involved in this study. I'll go through really quickly about the three significant findings that I've found so far. First, thank you, Bruce. Uh, white identifying patients are more likely to receive opioids even without the need to request them. They're being volunteered and offered to them. Go ahead, Bruce. Second, um, requests that are made by those identifying as persons of color are more likely to be rejected. And lastly, uh, Bruce, uh, for those who appealed uh, the physician's denial of prescribing opiates, those uh, uh, per who identified as persons of color were most likely to be den denied from their appeals. Uh, in, in other words, they, might, they can insist, but nothing happens and it doesn't really work out. All right, um, the study highlights the importance of the exposure that physicians need towards linguistic diversity and different linguistic practices. And I do want to note no that, you know, it's impossible to know whether the denial of opiates is discriminatory in intent, but what we can get from this study is that linguistically similar ways of expressing pain results in different uh, prescribing uh, decisions from the physician. At the same time, uh, linguistic practices that could be explained by cultural variations are also receiving a, you know, a disparity when it comes to results. And um, I want to go back to that narrative that the opioid crisis has 
mostly affected those who identify as white and uh, persons of color have nearly escaped that crisis. Maybe so because they were not getting the obvious that they needed. But this narrative can be harmful in a way that uh, it really uh, dismisses what is happening beyond uh, the, what we're, we're noticing around us, you know, as humanists in the humanities department, we should be looking beyond what we are seeing. And uh, if people are not getting in equal access to healthcare, they will go to the next possible, uh, you know, res they will resort to going to the streets uh, to alleviate their pain if they are in pain. And the problem with that is with prescription opioids, you know what you're taking. But if you're buying them from the streets, you don't know if they're laced with fentanyl. Also, if you are getting prescription opiates, you are more likely to be co-prescribed with Narcan, which is the uh, ant an antagonist of opiate overdoses. It can actually also be used for heroin and cocaine overdoses. And people don't have access to that just because uh, their, their pain's being dismissed as drug-seeking behavior. And yeah, that's pretty much what my research so far, I'm still working on improving it. Thanks, Peter. And uh, yeah, that'll be our whole program for today. But the food is, is waiting for us. Please take some. There's a ton over there. So let's all practice our conversation skills. Um, and circle Jake at the tamale station. All right, thanks, everybody, for coming. See everybody next time.